Well, who was Thomas Reed? That's a question that about 10 years ago was almost a quiz question. I think the first time I had occasion to publish anything on, on Reed was 1978, when the journal The Monist uh, hosted essays on, on Reed. And at the time, I think it's fair to say, he, he was very largely a forgotten figure. Late in the 18th century, he was a quite celebrated figure. In fact, uh, I can give you a sense of that. There's a lengthy history of correspondence between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams on a whole range of issues. This is uh, after the two of them had ceased being presidents of the United States, etc. Their friendship was patched up again. And there's one letter that uh, finds uh, Adams asking Jefferson, were you ever acquainted with Dougal Stewart? And Dougal Stewart was Thomas Reed's closest friend, probably, his former student. And, um, and in fact, Jefferson knew Dougal Stewart very well. And so Jefferson writes back and he says, yes, I, I knew Stewart very well. I regard him as one of the two greatest metaphysicians of the age. The other one Jefferson has in mind is Destut le Comte de Tracy. Uh, Adams goes on to say, well, I've just read his philosophy of the human mind, and I believe that in this work, in perspicuity, etc., etc., he exceeds uh, Aristotle, Plato, Descartes, wait, wait, and even Dr. Reed. Now, just a way of saying that uh, Adams did not have to say much more than that, because Reed was held in such high regard. One more bit of Americana, uh, because I'm trying to, to have you appreciate the distance over which Reed's influence ranged. He had a profound influence on secondary education in France, which came to be organized around Scottish common sense precepts. In the first major jurisdictional dispute ever settled by a U.S. Supreme Court, this was a 1793 case referred to as Chisholm versus Georgia. It, it had to do with whether or not a citizen could sue a state in a federal court. That's what the issue was. Uh, the opinion in that case was given by Justice James Wilson, a native Scot. And how does he begin the opinion? He says, well, before we get into the details of the case, if you would want to know the foundational principles upon which judgment itself depends, you can no do no better than to consult the estimable work of Dr. Reed, which he titles An Inquiry into the Human Mind. Now, those of you who haven't kept up with U.S. Supreme Courts over the course of decades and centuries, I should tell you that it would be very rare today that the Supreme Court would be citing Reed's inquiry. It's rather more likely they'd be citing Newsweek or something. But there was Reed's influence. He was for many years on the faculty at, at Aberdeen, and then he succeeded Adam Smith in the chair of moral philosophy at Glasgow. His first major work, he had published a couple of things before this, but the first major work was The Inquiry, which appeared in 1764 when Reed was 54, meaning by this time he would have been denied tenure at at least every major institution in the world because he hadn't published very much till, till, till this came out. He wanted to have the work read by Hume because it is quite a critical appraisal, not only of Hume's philosophy, but of what we refer to as British empiricism itself, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, and before them, Descartes, and before them, most of the ancients and medievalists, all of whom, or very nearly all of whom on Reed's account, subscribe to whatever their differences philosophically might be, they subscribe to this very odd position according to which we do not have direct knowledge of objects in the external world, but only some kind of mediated awareness, 
transmitted by the sense organs with absolutely no way of determining how validly or accurately or coherently the sense organs do capture what is in the external world. And Reed says if that theory is correct, which he will come to dub the ideal theory, the ideal theory referring to the proposition that all we know directly are our own ideas and we, can ha we can't get far enough out of the box to know accurately whatever it is that's bringing about those ideas. Reed says, if that theory is correct, quote, I lay my hands across my lips and become a skeptic. Because if in fact you're in no position, you have absolutely no epistemic resources available with which to distinguish between what your senses are reporting and what in the external world are exciting the sensory reports, then for all you know, there isn't anything in the external world. In fact, to be quite consistent in the application of the ideal theory is finally to take the position that George Barclay took. And that is simply to dismiss the proposition that there is a mind-independent, really existing external material world. Now that's skepticism of a certain kind. So this is uh, going to be what what Reed is addressing. And as I say, he, he wanted Hume at least to get a look at the manuscript. He didn't know Hume. They traveled in different circles. Hume, by the way, traveled in quite fashionable circles for all of his, shall we say, his uh, rather unorthodox re religious views, i.e. he had none, actually. Uh, um, he was still consulted on major university appointments though he was never able to get one himself, and that chiefly on the grounds of his lack of orthodoxy within a Scottish community that was serious about its Presbyterianism. But Hume traveled in, in rather fashionable circles. Those of you uh, familiar with Scottish uh, religious history knows that by the middle of the 18th century, there was something a divide within the Presbyterian communion uh, where a so-called moderate ring, wing and, and a more modern wing part of them were quite at home with favors from court, with trafficking in, in, in aristocratic and highly cultivated circles, whereas the rest were country parsons who thought that the proper business of a parson was to go into a community and serve its needs quite skeptical about any close association with government, with princes, with kings, etc. That branch of Presbyterianism, by the way, found itself quite at home in the United States and was very instrumental in establishing strong barriers between church and state. That's another chapter in intellectual and cultural history. So it's not surprising that Reed and Hume would not be rubbing shoulders. But they did have a friend in common, and that was Hugh Blair. And so Reed uh, asked Blair if he could have Hume read the inquiry. Hume scanned it. I can't believe he, he read it closely. At one point he says, it strikes me that it's a throwback to innate ideas. If Hume had a very discerning mind. There's no way you'd read the inquiry and see it as a throwback to any kind of, of Cartesian innate idea or Platonic innate idea. But that's when he concludes his letter back to Blair saying, look, my view is that clergymen should spend their time bothering each other and should leave philosophy to philosophers. So, so that was the first pass. And uh, Blair wanted Hume to give it a much closer reading, which Hume did do, and then wrote back to Reed, as I pointed out uh, a week ago, in a quite complimentary vein, and the correspondence at that point uh, ceased. In the last year of his life, when Hume sent off the final emendations for the publication of the last set of his essays that would be edited by his own hand, he informed his publisher that it, with these emendations, he thought he had addressed all of the objections raised by Dr. Reed. 
So this is years later. The inquiry came out in 1764. Hume is writing this in 1776, and he is still thinking in terms of whether or not he has addressed Reed's criticisms responsibly. Now, how are we to understand the nature of Reed's critique? Well, first, it's methodological. He is satisfied that philosophers who have come to defend what he calls the ideal theory have never adduced an iota of proof in its behalf. They have introspected on whatever it is that's taking place as far as they can tell in their own minds and each of them individually has then advanced a theory that is supposed to capture the operation of the human mind in all of the affairs of life, wherever mental life is found, in whatever culture, presumably any age group, under any condition of health or disease short of madness. And this is a very grandiose way of proceeding and on Reed's account, Reed being a strict Newtonian and Baconian, this is simply not the way science is done. This is what has always given philosophy a bad name. People sitting around spinning off conjectures and theories with absolutely no access to methods by which to determine in a systematic and scientific way whether the theory, whether the theory is grounded or groundless. So part of the critique is methodological. Um, you, you see that uh, very early in, in chapter 6, the focus of your reading should be on chapter 6 of the inquiry, the chapter on seeing. He says, if we pay proper attention to how our mind operates in our use of this faculty, we shall become aware that the visible appearance of objects is something we hardly ever notice. That is, if you were setting out to test the ideal theory, remember the ideal theory is generally is offering, is stipulating that the impressions formed by an external stimulus constitute that level of appearance at which you are aware of things. Nobody pays attention to this. I shall get to this a little later in lecture. For example, would you look up here right now? You, you see this, don't you? But the minute I do this, the pattern of visual stimulation is profoundly altered and if I do this, it is incredibly altered. And in fact, with every breath I take and every breath you take, the distance between us changes and the projection on the retina changes. There will be changes due to cloudy days, changes due to time of day, changes due to whether we've just eaten or haven't eaten yet, and on and on. Changes when we first get up in the morning, changes very late at night. How is it that we have a stability, a recurrence, a repeatability, a constant identification of stimuli as what they are, notwithstanding these profound changes at the level of appearances, so to speak, or sensory impressions, of which we take no note at all? So that's going to be something that recurs within the chapter of seeing. So as Reed says, wise men now agree, or ought to, that there's only one route to knowledge of nature's works, namely the path of observation and experiment. We have built into us a strong propensity for bringing particular facts and observations under general rules and applying such general rules to explain other effects or to show how to produce them. He goes on to say that the method is very much like the method used by ordinary people when they're attempting to satisfy certain objectives and goals. Quote, this intellectual process is familiar to every human creature in the common affairs of life, and it is the only one by which any real discoveries in philosophy can be made. Conjectures and theories are created by men and will always be found to be very unlike the things created by God or by nature. Uh, Reed interchangeably uses God, the author of our being, the mint of nature, etc. It's quite clear what he's 
getting at. He labors under what Professor Dawkins, <coughs> Professor Dawkins would call the God delusion, I guess. Now, Reed's own background gives him an authoritative position with just how it is science proceeds. On his mother's side, he was a Gregory. Gregory was one of the successors to the Lucasian Professorship of Mathematics at Cambridge. Reed was an expert in optics. He was original in his thinking in mathematics. And he was tied in with a Scottish educational scheme that only fairly recently had abandoned what was called the regenting system. I don't know if that's a term familiar to you, the regenting system. Under the regenting system, when students arrived at university, they would be assigned a, a tutor, a, re, a regent, who for their entire undergraduate years, their preparatory years, would teach them every subject. So the regent would teach, yes, Latin and Greek, and mathematics and astronomy and rhetoric and philosophy, etc. Now they gave it up. Sooner or later, I guess you think you have to. Why? Well, advances in all of these fields having been considerable, particularly from the 17th century on, the thought was that nobody could have the kind of commanding knowledge necessary to teach all those subjects over a course of years. But Reed himself was part of that cadre, prepared to do that, and his grounding in the sciences was expert, highly developed, and, and known to be. The, um, we've now seen published a fair amount of his previously unpublished papers. The first huge collection of unpublished papers by Reed were held at Aberdeen on microfilm as part of what was called the Berkwood Collection, and uh, when it came out, I had an opportunity to go through every page of it. It, it is quite remarkable, particularly the, the fraction of the Berkwood papers devoted to physics, optics, and mathematics, and astronomy. General solutions to the problem of the aberration, I mean highly sophisticated solutions uh, to astronomical problems of consequence. So Reed is not simply tooting a horn, he's not wagging a finger. He has a scientific cast of mind shaped by a close and long study of the sciences and is persuaded that the methods advocated by Bacon and by Newton are simply not followed by philosophers who nonetheless make all sorts of claims about our knowledge of the external world and the nature of the external world without ever getting out of an armchair. And when they get out of an armchair, what is it they discover? Well, Reed says they discover what Hume discovers when he got out of his armchair. The first thing we learn in the treatise when Hume is finished discussing causation, which I shall take up later in this term, is that of course when he goes out into the world, he thinks the way everyone else does. That it's only in the privacy of his study that he realizes uh, that there are these conundrums associated with the concept of causation. What does Reed say about that? He says, we see then that Mr. Hume's philosophy is very much like a hobby horse, which a man when he is ill can keep at home with him and ride to his contentment. But just in case he should bring it into the exchange, bring it into the marketplace, his friends would quickly impanel a jury and confiscate his estates and have the solicitude never to leave him alone. The point being that a skeptical position on something as fundamental as causation puts you at peril. And now the question is whether the dictates of common sense, which are serviceable throughout the animal economy, are to be abandoned on the basis of a conjecture that has no more authority associated with it, certainly no observational or scientific authority, no more authority than the particular argument advanced by a particular conjecturer. So I say again, there is this critique of method. And then, not only 
is the method an introspective one, but rather bravely, the introspective proceeds to generalize his results to nothing less than the entire human population. As Reed says, no man has ever been able to set out for us distinctly and methodically all the operations of the thinking principle within himself. But if some philosopher did achieve this feat, this would reveal only the anatomy of one particular subject. And if applied to human nature in general, it would be both incomplete and wrong. For you don't have to think very hard to realize that the differences amongst human minds are greater than the differences amongst any other beings that we regard as belonging to the same species. We differ from each other more than cats differ from each other, he wants to say. In other words, the n equals 1 model is simply inapplicable in a domain like this. All right, who's the culprit then? Well, you can go all the way back to the ancients. Reed finds the most influential of the current culprits being Descartes. And about Descartes' position, he says this. Descartes wants us to think that he got out of all this craziness through this logical argument. Cogito, ergo, sum. But obviously he was in his right mind all the time and never seriously doubted his own existence. That argument doesn't prove that his existence, it takes it for granted. I am thinking, he says, therefore I am. And isn't it just as good reasoning to say, I am sleeping, therefore I am. Or I'm doing nothing, therefore I am. If a body moves, it must exist, no doubt. But if it is at rest, it must exist then too. Furthermore, supposing it has been proved that my thought and my consciousness must be had by something and consequently that I exist, how do I know that all the series of thoughts that I remember belong to one subject and that the I of this moment is the very same individual I of yesterday and of times past? Descartes didn't see fit to start this doubt but Locke did. He's getting to Locke on personal identity. And in order to resolve it, he solemnly laid it down that personal identity consists in consciousness. That is, if you are conscious that you did X a year ago, this consciousness makes you the very same person that did X. And Reed says this is transparently preposterous. Uh, madhouses all over the world are filled with people who will tell you to a moral certainty battles they lost a year ago and duels in which they suffered mortal death, etc. Some of them will have hands inside their jackets lamenting their sad fate in Belgium at the Battle of Waterloo and wanting to know where their three-cornered hat went. The fact that you recall having done something surely cannot be the basis upon which you've established that you did it. Now, all of this speculation on Reed's account finally leads to solipsism. As he says, Descartes, Malebranche, and Locke have all used their talents and skill to prove the existence of a material world, but with very little success. For these three great men, with the best good will, have not been able to draw from all the treasures of philosophy one argument that is fit to convince a thinking person of the existence of anything other than himself. This is an anticipation of something we find in Kant's Prolegomena and in the second edition of the first Critique of Pure Reason. What does Kant say the continuing scandal in philosophy is? That philosophers have been unable to establish the reality of the external world. This is precisely what this mediational ideal theory leads to. You simply do not have epistemic resources to get outside the narrow boundaries of your own conscious life. 
So for all you know, there isn't anything external to that, do you see? And Reed's point in defending common sense precepts is, if that's where philosophy wants to place its bets against the common sense understandings of the human race since a time out of memory, then they are on a collision course. And the consequence of this is that the most uh, thinking parts of the world will come to regard philosophy as simply ridiculous. So he is at much, and when he uses philosophy, he's, he's talking about a, essentially a natural science approach to, to addressing problems. So what is the real theory, finally? It's the ideal theory, the theory that's central to David Hume's copy principle. And so we can ask, is it really the case that every simple idea is the copy of a simple impression? Or more generally, that the contents of thought are derived from impressions rather, from the, rather than from the facts of the external world? The culprit, you see, is a radical empiricism that begins not with the nature of actual creatures, but with a theory. The nature of actual creatures is such that it requires us to understand what kind of adaptive mechanisms they have. If, if you think I'm reading a kind of Darwinian element into Reed's account, it's there. When Reed talks about the lowly caterpillar, that crawls across a thousand leaves until it finds the one that's right for its diet. Do you think the caterpillar learned that? There would be no caterpillars. For the amount of time it would take to learn which leaf is the right leaf, and who's doing the teaching? Suppose you just happen to come across a bad run of leaves. Goodbye, caterpillar. So nature must fit creatures out with a readier means of adapting to the demands of the environment. It can't all be experiential. When Locke says, I answer in a word from experience, this simply won't work. You know, there's almost a, a, an anticipation of, uh, oh my goodness, am I going to say this name? All right, with apologies. There's an anticipation of Freud in some of this. Look, when, uh, oh dear me, uh, you might be too young for this, I'm not sure. I'll take a chance. When Freud talks about the, uh, the oral stage of psychosexual development, here's a question. He's a, he's a neurologist, he's well trained in, in the biological sciences. He knows it takes a lot of work to drain a bottle or a breast. In fact, many, many years later, into the middle of the 20th century, we, we actually developed strain gauges that you could uh, put on the cheek of infants and calculate in, in ergs the amount of work it's taking to drain a bottle. Trust me, it's a lot. I mean, unless you're a brute for hard work, it's something you just give up on. You could try it now if you weren't afraid that your friends would laugh at you. Get yourself a bottle, fill it with warm milk, lie on a, more or less flat on a pillow, and try to drain the thing. You're, go, you're going to, you know, sort of a very difficult after a while. And you probably will raise a profound physiological question. How the hell do they do it? I mean, three, four times a day. Now, here are your choices. They've studied the metabolic physiology of human life. They know what their electrolyte requirements and vitamin D and so forth, what that's all about. And with reluctance, but with resolve, they say, I better drink that bottle. Not likely, all right? So how do we account for it? They like doing it. The oral stimulation is gratifying. The reason babies do all that work is because they derive pleasure from it. The Freudian account is that nature makes pleasurable what in fact is mandatory for survival. 
Sir Thomas Brown in Religio Medici, which is a great essay, you must read it. It's a wide-ranging essay. And then he gets to the question of human reproduction. And it's, Brown writes magnificently, and he gives a characterization of the preposterous athletic undertakings required for procreation the ridiculousness, the postural and acrobatic maneuvers. And he says, surely a providential and all-wise divinity could have contrived some less embarrassing and nonsensical means than this. Now, I think Thomas Brown with, had uh, nine children. He, he overcame his scruples, but... Uh, but but again but again what what one is getting at is is that nature predisposes actions of a certain kind by making the action itself pleasurable as the basis upon which the entity undertakes it in the first instance now is that a return to innate ideas no it has nothing to do with ideas now let's take something more fit for the family hour. Language. What is the empiricist account of language? What's Locke's account of language? On what basis does this become spectacles? On what basis does this become pen? Well, by convention. That is to say, as a result of the way these things are used and as a result of our living in society, we reach a certain agreement that objects of a certain kind will be named. They will get certain names. They will be given a certain nominal essence. So an object of a certain kind that behaves in a certain way, particularly when you put it along uh, white paper capable of absorbing ink, and so that's the sort of thing which in a certain culture over a period of time has come to be referred to as a pen. Reed says this simply won't work. The word pen is an artificial term. Look, look here, I, I have to use audiovisual aids. Now you have to look at me very carefully. Right, watch this now. Pen. Does that have anything in common with this at all? There's nothing in common with it at all. So, so this is artificial. It's, it's not like I am conveying the properties of the object in question. Now, in order for us to agree to enter into a covenant, a compact, such that for, henceforth, this sort of thing is what we call a pen. There must be some language in place that allows us to establish covenants and agreements. Do you see? Because unless we have some way of communicating with each other, our concurrence and our agreement, then no possible convention can be brought about. So there must be a natural language if there ever is to be an artificial language. Reed puts it beautifully when he says, if there had never been an artificial language, I'm using an artificial language now, Words, grammar, you know, that sort of thing. If there had never been an artificial language, every man would be a dancer and a painter. Do you see? That is, if you take a look at how preliterate societies instruct their young, very often it is in the form of a dance. It's choreographed. Certain steps and procedures and values are conveyed in ways that can be perceived by creatures already tuned to this, kind of, to this kind of information. So unless there is a natural language in place on which in scaffolding fashion you can hang an artificial language, the latter would never take place. Now Reed wants this to be architectonic for much that goes into perception and cognition. There must be some natural system in place which takes inputs of a certain kind and from them 
generates information at the level at which creatures can use it. Now what is that internal mechanism? When, when, Locke, refers, when, when Locke refers to sensations, or Hume refers to perceptions, what, what is taking place when the external world delivers stimulation? What's taking place is the stimulation produces a natural sign. This is why I asked you to look at me. Look again. Sometimes you have to do audiovisual things twice, right? Look again. Now watch. Pen. Nothing in common. Pen. Nothing in common. Now, how does this get into your agile, active system? It gets in there naturally by a process that we refer to as physiological. The cornea collects some of the light, it goes through the lens, it's delivered to the retina. The retina has cells that respond chemically when a certain amount of photopigment is decomposed, a small DC signal is generated in the tail of the receptor cell, when that reaches a critical level, you start actually getting impulse activity in the optic nerve, which goes back to something called Myers loop, and etc. And, and the ball's in play. None of that has anything in common with this. So all of those natural responses to this, which Reed refers to as the natural signs, all of those natural signs excited by an object now somehow must be transposed into the thing signified because what you are not seeing when I hold this up is activity in your visual system. You're not seeing photopigments being decomposed. You're not seeing uh, electrical activity in your, in your optic nerve fibers. If I may say so, you're seeing a pen. Now, Reed takes it as the quaestio vexata, how the system goes from the natural sign to the thing signified. That, he says, we do not know. Well, that was 1764. It's 2013. How do we go from physiological responses to the phenomenology of experience? I don't know. Do you? If you do, don't waste time in here. Get home, write it up, publish it, and invite me to the Nobel Prize banquet in your honor. Well, there aren't really qualia. Yeah, there really are qualia. So yes, I'm sorry about that. Yes, there are. For example, that panel of wall is red. Right. Now, why do I call it red? I'm a radian, all right. Why do I call it red? Because it's red. I shall get to that. Now, if you follow Reed on the matter of, of natural signs and the problem of going from the natural sign to the thing signified, and how Reed's concept of a natural language being the necessary precondition for an artificial language, then you're ready for perhaps the most daunting chapter in the inquiry, a part of it that Hume admitted he had some trouble with. A lot of persons have had trouble with it ever since. The section referred to as the geometry of visibles. Now this is a bit elaborate. I urge you to read Reed's account of it, but I think right now it might be of more benefit to listen than to write because I'll probably speak about this more quickly than, than your note-taking. Here's the question before the house. When I look at an object that, that I am strongly inclined to regard as being in the external world, is the result of that inspection, the result, the conscious result, an impression, an idea, a sensation? Or is it the registration of the object itself? That's the question. 
That's the question that's going to divide a realist, a Reedian realist, from a phenomenalist, a subjectivist, choose your word. All right. Here's the thought experiment. Imagine yourself positioned in the center of an indefinitely large sphere, such that your eye is at the absolute center of the sphere, on the outer surface of which can be projected any object that you like. All right? Now, one thing that's obvious is that anything you project onto the surface of the sphere, whatever the object is, will be curved by the contour of the sphere itself. So everything that you see on the surface of the sphere will be visibly curved. And in fact, if I were to project a straight edge onto the surface of the sphere, that, look here, that tangibly straight object would be visibly curved. There's an exception to this. If the projection is on any of the circumferential lines of the sphere, such that every point is the same distance from the retina itself, those objects will be visibly straight. So that even if they were curved on the surface, that is, even if they were tangibly curved, they will be perceived as visibly straight. This can be shown. All right, now we can take that arrangement and we can have one circumference clipped as to form the base of a triangle. You see where this is going, don't you? Now we can take another circumferential line and clip it so that it forms one of the sides. And we can take yet another circumferential line and clip it so that it forms the other side. So I now have something that is, what? A visible rectilinear triangle, because as these are equatorial or circumferential lines, they're visibly straight. But what has actually been formed? A spherical triangle has been formed with some very interesting properties. It's angled sum to more than 180 degrees, for example. You following this? Just, when you read the chapter, you'll follow it more closely. You can do the same thing with circumferential lines to form visible straight lines. And in fact, you can do it in such a way as to form visibly, visibly straight, visibly parallel lines, which in fact tangibly will intersect at two loci. What he's doing is anticipating by about 70 years Riemannian geometry, a non-Euclidean geometry. This controversy in the literature did, did Reed really anticipate Riemann? It's, I shan't get into that. The correct answer to the question is yes, but it's a, <laughs> it's a long story. I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Because, of, he, he, because he was very committed to mathematics. He, he knew what he was doing. Here. Now, what's this all about? Right now, I would ask you to write something. I'd ask you to draw something. If you care to, you don't have to. But if you try to draw as good a right angle triangle as you can, it's just uh, don't shake, uh, don't need a ruler, but do it as best you can. You can look on, that's right, you can look on his. You don't all have to do it. All right, so there, he's, he's looking on yours. He's, he's uh, investing you with a certain authority on this, all right? The answer to the question is, uh, how does that project itself onto your visual system is spherically. Now when you look at it, what do you see? You see a rectilinear triangle. In other words, you don't see the impression, you don't see the copy of an impression, you see the object. Now, 
is this the experimentum crucis? Reed doesn't regard this as an experimentum crucis. Reed regards this as a way of illustrating how you actually prosecute the scientific agenda when the question before the house is, in what way are the events in the external world represented in mental life? You actually have to do something to answer a question like that. You've got to go beyond sitting around and thinking hard about it. You, you know what I mean? I mean thinking really. Wasn't David Hume brilliant? Yes, he was. That's not enough. In fact, if you're less clever, you're likely to work a little harder at it. I'm going to offer you a quite modern version of the same story, because I, I think if I cast it in late, later 20th century terms, it might actually be um, more accessible to you. The projection of any stimulus on the retina is very noisy, because the medium through which light passes from the external world to the retina is dispersive. The light is spread out. So in fact, if you plotted the actual radiation reaching the retina as a function of location where the stimulus is aimed at the fovea, you'd get something like a normal distribution of luminances because of the optical spread. How's the system designed? Why is it that when I present a point source, you see a point source and not some smudge? Because optically, it is smudged. Well, the reason you don't see a smudge and you do see a point is this. The system is arranged in such a way that a region of greater activity will initiate inhibitory effects on its near neighbors. So that, in fact, the region that is maximally stimulated by the light will inhibit uh, retinal cells adjacent to it that are less stimulated. In other words, you get a physiological, by way of inhibition, you get a physiologically cleaned up signal from what begins as an optically noisy signal. The last one on earth in the 18th century who would have been surprised by findings like that would be Reed. This is precisely what he's getting at. The system must be designed in such a way as to achieve these adaptations without benefit of reflection, thought, philosophical enlightenment, etc. Now finally, I want you to come to terms with how Reed's term common sense should be understood because it's very easily misunderstood. In the prolegomena, when, when Kant wants to make clear the great respect he has for Hume, well, part of the way he makes the point is by saying how foolish it was for people like, quote, Reed, Oswald, and Beatty to think that they could defeat something like Hume by appealing to no more than the wisdom of the herd. Now, a Reedian principle of common sense is not mob rule. In fact, one of the early translations of Reed's inquiry, anonymously translated into German, if this had been my translation, I wouldn't have put my name on it either, renders common sense <coughs> gemeine Menschenverstand, like a common criminal, you know, that's the, sort of the common run of uh, understanding. Reed tells us what he means by a principle of common sense. If there are core precepts that we are under a necessity to take for granted, we are under an, it's not chosen, it's not opinion, it's not a voice vote, it certainly isn't mob rule. If there are fundamental precepts that we are under an obligation to take for granted in all of the ordinary conduct of life, that up is not down, black is not white, if, if, if they are in place, these, he said, are what I call a principle of common sense. And what opposes these is quite literally Nonsense. It, it would be a sign of a kind of disordered mind 
Yes, I can show you people who are firmly convinced that the thoughts they're having are actually someone else's. We generally increase the medication when that happens. We do not redo philosophy of mind. So I would say at the end of uh, the first encounter, at least on the question of the ideal theory and the notion of our, of, of our access to the external world, our direct access being blocked by the organs of mediation, the Reedian account, I believe, is successful as a criticism of method and is highly suggestive at the level of relevant evidence over and against an ideal theory for which there isn't evidence. Now, the kind of evidence you might think works in its behalf is the evidence from illusion. Uh, um, and Reed is very good on that, and I, I shall be covering some of that week, week after next. But, but uh, w when you read the chapter, you'll see that uh, suppose you're looking at a white rose and you put on red tinted glasses, you don't think the color of the rose has changed. Of course the condition of the visual, assist, the visual system affects how things appear. How do we know that? We know that because we have veridical perception when these things are not laboring against us, do you see? Every person knows that if he's got a bilious disease, things normally tasting sweet now taste bitter. Why? Because the bile titer in the, in the circulation is way up. Get your gallbladder checked. You know, that sort of thing. Now, if in fact you were victims, if you were hostage to every transitory change in, in stimuli in the external world, well, understand, not only is everything in the external world constantly changing in one way or another, but so are we. Cells are dying, new cells are coming about. I mean, if this were the level at which conscious life had to be lived, it would be unlivable. And that's uh, read on the ideal theory. I shall see you in a week. <laughs>